communications about the attention to people, not just to property. Wow. Daryl, because uh, you know I can go on. I got so many. <laughs> Poor David, he just froze <laughs> next time he sees me, you know. <laughs> I have so many questions. But go ahead, Daryl. <laughs> sure, thanks. You know, I want to go back for for just a second when we were uh, when you were discussing junk in, junk out, right? And yeah. with the really, I, I call them the engineers and and those that are inputting the information into the system that uh, determine the information that is then put out from the system. Yeah, is there a uh, connection uh, between the junk in, junk out analogy and? You know what what appears to me to be almost like a a limiting of access to technology for black students because it seems to me that if you want to be certain that you have a diverse population that's putting information in so that the information that's coming out reflects the diversity of the community that exists, that you would want to do something to increase the accessibility to technology for students of color am am I off on this? No, it, it makes perfect sense, Daryl. Um, it is, is you know, it's the, it's the kind of you know, next level analysis that we that we need. You know, the there there has been a lot said about investments from the current presidential administration in HBCUs. At the same time, we also know that there are not you know a lot of uh, HBCUs that are at the top tier of you know research institutions. Top mm-hmm. tier, not so much in terms of. Um, uh, of um, you know, kind of uh, reputation, but I mean, top tier as far as getting that research money in, getting the programs in, exactly, and what have you. And so that's those are the kind of investments that are needed from the public sector, from government, and also from the private sector. Uh, I'm not going to claim that they've saved the world on this, but Google, I know, it does have some investments at Howard University uh, that have been written up, and I'm really you know pleased to see that. But you know, Howard's right here in the backyard of D.C. is also you know the mecca. Mm-hmm. We need all of our HBCUs and our PBIs that aren't even uh, the black institutions that are not HBCUs to get it because it's not just about the institution. It's about reaching the people who are there. And so mm-hmm. who codes, Daryl, to your question matters. Who programs matters. Who does the quality control matters. You know, mm-hmm. I, I'll tell you, this is the, the, because we came to this work from the context of fighting online hate, we have done a big dance with YouTube, which is owned by Google, about how mm. YouTube is really a an information superhighway for white supremacist content. Right. And they tell us that they can do a really good job of, you know, finding the N-word um, in videos and online and also finding pornography online because they can use their algorithms and the technology to do it. And I say, well, what if somebody uh, writes or, or says online, does an interview and says, well, you know, that boy, uh, those boys, Hewitt and, 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 and Jones, they need to go back to where they came from. Those boys don't mm-hmm. belong uh, here. Will you pick that up? Because we know that's racially coded, barely veiled language, mm-hmm. right? They said, nope, we can't pick that up, right? Mm. So we need programmers who can make the technology work for us, not mm-hmm. just for corporate interests. If the technology doesn't realize that I'm being racially harassed, then what good is it? What yes. Good is it? So we need to make sure that we have people who understand through lived experience and through practical understanding the way the gaps in technology and how the technology needs to be made to work for us if it's going to exist at all. Wow. Uh, you know, Damon, uh, wow, <laughs> Daryl, that's uh, such, such a good insight. Uh, you know, what are in each of your testimonies, and you testified a lot on this su- subject and you've written on it, um, what are your top recommendations? I mean, clearly when Gavin Newsom uh, saw the ad uh, that uh, was put out by X uh, Twitter yesterday, um, by its own you know, CEO, by Elon Musk, uh, this you know, just really misrepresenting, uh, you know, a Harris. He wrote, you know, my state is going to take care of this. Uh, look for legislation from us to deal with regulating this kind of disinformation, uh, this kind of you know, purposefully not labeled. I mean, think about it. The, it must took the actual disclaimer off of it before he served it out to millions and millions of people. Uh, 
you know, they're going to, he said that we got to come up with legislation immediately. He said, look for us in the next month to pass something to deal with this. I know there's been actions in Congress and other states, uh, you know, regarding deep fakes, regarding, uh, you know, all of this kind of misinformation, trying to regulate, like you said, AI to be racially, you know, fairer and better and not uh, perpetuating, uh, you know, the past. Uh, there's been, you know, uh, a couple of uh, executive orders by the uh, Biden-Harris administration on regulating, uh, you know, uh, AI and the use of it by federal agencies, et cetera. Uh, could you tell people right now, so as they're listening, because they're not going to hear this co- this conversation that we're having today is rare on any radio or television show. Rare. So tell people right now what your top recommendations are for policy. Listen, folks, this is what you should be advocating for at your state and your local and at the federal level. Tell people what your top recommendations are for needed uh you know, legislative uh, change. Well, thank you for the question. I, w- I will preface it by saying this. We've only given a few examples. We talked about elections and consumer <laughs> right. issues generally, but people need to say AI is being used to determine who gets approved for a mortgage, who gets a job interview, what your interest rates are when you buy a car, uh, what kind of health care you get, the prices and goods and services sold online, uh, and more. Uh, Rite Aid used AI facial recognition to determine who gets into their stores. They labeled uh, erroneously black folks as likely uh, likely um, uh, shoplifters, right? So these are yeah. all the different types of applications. So what we should be asking for is this. AI must be regulated in a comprehensive way. Not California can do what it can do, but we need it nationwide. And what we need is to, AI should be treated like anything else. Like a like the Food and Drug Administration treats food and drugs uh, before before certain drugs can be authorized uh, for use. Uh, like uh, cars are regulated. Um, like you know any like products are regulated. We need to treat AI like the product that it essentially is. There are many different types of products, and they have to be regulated by some central federal entity. Period. Because if they're not, the harms are just going to continue. Uh, that's number one. Num- number two, the tools have to be tested for bias both before they're released and even after because these tools are generative. They learn, right? At least they think they learn. Uh, we also need the duty of care. We need a right to be able to sue about AI. Right now, many folks are trying to cobble together different c- federal civil rights statutes or state statutes to try to address the harms of AI, but it's a really tough road to hold. We need a comprehensive federal legislation and a right to sue within that. And we also need what I alluded to earlier, the data transparency, the explainability um, that can really kind of give us that full perspective of knowing what's happening, not just wondering what is happening. So those are some of the key pieces we call for these things in our online Civil Rights Act. If readers go to our website, lawyerscommittee.org, you can see on one of the uh, features on the carousel on the front page is the Online Civil Rights Act. There's a fact sheet, uh, just two pages, I think, that folks can download to learn more about this. Wow. And, and you know, uh, Dana, really interesting to, to hear. It, it's almost like the federal government is following behind the states, right? Because we have states that are en- enacting legis- legislation and statutes, but the federal government is, is having difficulty, for whatever reason, trying to enact legislation. Is there any particular state or statute that, uh, of a state that you could lift up as, a, as you know, sort of the, the role model, the gold standard right now on what's happening with, with AI and, and trying to uh, put limitations on it? Unfortunately, I can't lift up any particular state as the role model. I will say that um, there are consumer laws in California and in the District of Columbia that have been leveraged uh, to address a combination of online hate and some of these uh, AI challenges. But we, mm-hmm. we need laws that sound more that sound in more than just consumer protection, but also about racial justice and, and, and civil rights protection more broadly. Mm-hmm. So I won't lift up any particular State, but the point is, there's lots of great ideas out there. 
you know, members of the mm-hmm. Congressional Black Caucus, Congresswoman Yvette Clark, uh, who I want to lift up out of New York, uh, has been a, a real leader on, on Capitol Hill. But there has to be the political will, not just uh, bipartisan, but even within each caucus, um, you know, each, each, each political party, to really get legislation across the finish line. Um, there's trouble even getting privacy legislation uh, that is that actually makes sense, because uh, not all of it does, but the legislation that makes sense across the finish line. So there has to be a real political will. I, I appreciate what the Biden administration has done with their early blueprint uh, for an AI Bill of Rights and then also with the executive order uh, that, that followed, but we've got to finish the deal uh, on the Hill through actual legislation to empower people and to protect people. Wow. That is so amazing. Uh, Damon, you know, I know there are people out here listening. Uh, there's a couple things we would like you to do. Please tell people. Uh, who are saying, you know, this is my my heart, this is my passion, this is the work I want to do, but I'm disconnected. I don't know how to get involved. I don't know how to uh, be an advocate in this field. I don't know who's leading. Uh, you know, how do I become, uh, you know, engaged? How do I become an, a, a voice, you know, for change here? What would you say to them? How would you advise them? Because the last time we did a technology show, our young audience members went crazy about, you know, just how do they become leaders in this field? Right. Well, I, I think it's important to plug in, you know, for everyone as as best or however you can. I want to lift up that one of our partners is Data for Black Lives. And they have, uh, I saw on their website, one of their first convenings um, in, in a while uh, coming up in November in, in Miami. And the tagline for the conference is data as protest, data as accountability, data as collective action. <laughs> And so oh my goodness! Data for Black Lives. Folks can go to d4bl.org uh, to find out more information about Data for Black Lives and to uh, get information about the conference. You're going to have across the spectrum of amazing speakers. Some of the topics are going to include um, uh, just data sets and how to use them, data governance, algorithms, impacts on democracy. Uh, what, what have you. Uh, so it, it's just a great way to plug in that is both accessible but also not dumbed down, right, if people get treated as smart as you are, right? Um, yeah. I also encourage people to take a look at our website, lawyerscommittee.org. There's a special feature on the homepage uh, on the carousel about the Online Civil Rights Act. And so we don't have an engagement opportunity in the same way, but I think it's important to get educated because we're just downloading that one- or two-page fact sheet can really help people uh, have these conversations in your own homes and neighborhoods at the barbershop, you know, or in your own workplace. Uh, so I think it's really important to, to, to soak that information up. Wow. Uh, so we just really, you are amazing. Can you tell people how they can reach you? Because you know you're in trouble now. Folks have heard you. They're going to want to hear more from you. <laughs> How do you know how that goes? You know, I've been dealing every since, you know, last Sunday. Everybody in the world, Sister Barbara, Sister Barbara, Sister Barbara, tell me this, tell me that. Okay, so how do people get in touch with you, Damon? Well, you can uh, you can reach us, um, you know, as, again, um, you know, for media press at lawyerscommittee.org. You can reach me uh, on, on the gram, as they say. Uh, the tag, the handle is at dhewitt06. And if you decide to use uh, that other guy's platform, X, uh, you can use <laughs> at uh, because I think we, we don't abdicate any platform, but at, at Damon T. Hewitt uh, is the way we do it as well. D- J- Daryl? Uh, Damon, you know, we, we thank you so much for being with us and for, you know, certainly, you know, telling our audience, educating our audience about Ooh. a lot of the issues that are, that are that are going on, that are current, and that will continue to be going on for, for a period of time. But, you know, we, we definitely, definitely want to extend a lot of thanks to you for taking the time out to talk to us, to, uh, to you know, enlighten us with regards to what's happening. And we look forward to you coming back and, uh, and keeping us, uh, keeping us uh, abreast with, with what's going on and the advancements that occur. And Damon, you know, 
And David, you know, we train you know, young people to be uh, voting rights, you know, uh, racial justice advocates, uh, leaders. Uh, and we're going to be doing another training during the CBC. 